series today on making things new. Just to kind of locate us, the first three messages in this series all built on each other. We started with talking about the necessity of, of reflection, and then we talked about how reflection leads to a sense of confession, and that the confession, when it's done in the context of forgiveness, uh, those things work together to kind of give us a new lease, give us a new start, and a clean slate to help us to move forward uh, in a better way maybe than we had previously in, in a way that's more in keeping with God's call in our lives. Mm -hmm. What we're doing now is we're going to jump into uh, some other things that also are very vital in terms of helping us to continually grow, to continually be renewed in life and certainly in our faith. And what we're going to look at over the coming weeks are some of the spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines that John Wesley um, valued and believed were cornerstones of living a, a vital and vibrant Christian faith. And today we're going to do something similar uh, in terms of setting this up with uh, the first one we're going to talk about today. Because I believe that without this, the other ones tend to fall a little bit flat. And it's a sense of fellowship. It's a sense of fellowship. Because when we think about worship, if we're worshiping in a faceless crowd with people that we have no connection with, it tends to take something away from that worship service. If we're praying with people that we really don't know, then we don't know what to pray for for. We may, we may not be as comfortable. And so on and so forth. So we're going to start out by taking a look at fellowship today. And I want to um, I want to sort of front load the message with some sort of, uh, I guess, understanding, some basic um, principles of fellowship. And uh, fellowship very much is about us coming together as a people. It's about us getting to know one another as individuals and not just as a crowd. Because those relationships are what, what form the group that holds us together as a congregation. Those relationships are what form the bonds that allow us to interact as brothers and sisters in Christ, celebrating the places where we have victories, but also being vulnerable enough to come to one another when we feel a sense of defeat and seek comfort and seek assistance. It gives us the comfort with one another when we see somebody slipping and maybe falling uh, to hold them accountable and, and help them to overcome whatever temptation may be in their life. And so this sense of fellowship is very, very key to living out our Christian faith. What I don't want to mistake is as we go through this, that there's a sense of the only people we're supposed to hang around with are Christians. I, I, heard a number of different, not, not in here, but I've heard folks give that impression that um, if anybody's not a believer, you shouldn't be friends with them. And I personally think that that's all uh, Because if our job is to model Christ to the world, how do we do that if the only people we are spending time around significantly are other people that already know what that looks like? So, I'm not saying that we have exclusive fellowship with one another. That's not it at all. But I am saying that fellowship with other like-minded people like Joyce was talking about is critical to keeping us on track. If we never are around other people that, that, um, that are committed to living their lives for God, that are committed to modeling their lives after Christ, it becomes very easy for us to follow our own way and to fall away from a more faithful way of doing so that's kind of where we're, we're charted today. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the scriptures that we have. And I think that they help us answer a little more deeply the question of why. And I just kind of gave you a few surface reasons why fellowship is important. But I think these two scriptures go even a little bit deeper into the, um, the reality of, of why fellowship is significant. Interestingly, do you realize there's very few places in the Bible, if any, that actually say, be in fellowship with one another? It's hinted at. In Hebrews here, it says, don't forsake the gathering together as some are accustomed to do. That it hints that fellowship is important. Paul, over and over again, says things like, bear one another's burdens, lift one another up in prayer. That doesn't necessarily say have fellowship with other people, but it assumes that fellowship is occurring. 
When you look in Acts, and it talks about the early church, it says they shared all things in common. They ate together. They drank together. They worshiped together. They spent time together outside of just worship. It doesn't say there, therefore you must be in fellowship with, another, with one another. But there is implied that fellowship is a key cornerstone part of living in faith. One of the things that Paul felt was indispensable was a sense of community. That faith is not something that can be lived in a vacuum. Because we all have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. And therefore, God is speaking to each of us. And so places where we may be blind, somebody else may have sight. And without that fellowship and interaction, we have a very, very tentative faith at best many times. And so this scripture uh, in Hebrews comes at it, I think, from a sense of accountability. If we look at the overall context of that verse, it talks about lifting one another up and encouraging one another to be loving and to be gracious. It, it talks about, about helping one another to live out our Christian faith. And then after it says, don't forsake getting together, it goes into what can happen if we do. It starts talking about falling away from God. It starts talking about allowing temptation to overcome us. And then what that does is that draws us away from God. And if we're not in a place that can help bring us back in, we can have our back turned and be walking, you know, this direction with God back here. We don't even realize it until we turn around and God's barely a speck in a rearview mirror. And so fellowship with one another is that continual reminder that we serve a common God. That we model our lives after a common redeemer. And that there are things that, that are markers of a Christian life that we should strive to attain and strive to, to, to model. People can see things that we can't. And if we're not in a place that's looking the same direction as we are, if we're not in a, a place with people that that have that understanding of God and the call of God on our lives, we're going to miss things. And so there's a sense of accountability. Now, in Ecclesiastes, it goes to a different place. Because it talks about the toil of the individual is vanity. In other words, it's meaningless. And it's that sense of... Um, I saw an interesting thing here this week. Have any, did any of you see the guy that was buried and straddling his, his motorcycle? There's this, I think it was out in Ohio. And there's this crane with this massive plexiglass and it almost looks like a museum case. And, and you got the guys was embalmed, decked out in leather, on his heart, being lowered into the ground. And somebody commented on the picture and said, did anybody ever tell this guy you can't take it with you? <laughs> you know? And I think that's something that you know, all of us come to terms with at some point when we realize, you know, if I'm alone, it doesn't matter how much I've accumulated because at the end of the day, if I'm alone, all the money and all the, all the gadgets and all the property and all the world are not filling whatever it, that hole is inside of that loneliness. And so this is a sense that, yes, you know, the very, very popular scripture, the four to three strands are not easily broken, two people can stand against one, that kind of a thing. So we have that sense of strength and fellowship. But I want to go a little further with the sense of reward in fellowship. Because when we are doing things together, when we are all marching in the same direction and our lives are focused on breaking the kingdom of God into this world, what happens is we celebrate that together and we see it more powerfully together when we are doing it in community. We see it more powerfully because we're doing it more efficiently and more effectively because what happens is you have people that if I start to get off over here and, and maybe I'm projecting plans that are very self-centered, then I have other people that are able to pull me back and say, now wait a minute, yeah, that's going to make you look real good, but what's that doing for the rest of the world? What's that doing to break the kingdom of God? into the community, into this church, into the world around us. And there's accountability to make sure we're continually pushing all in that same direction. There's also that sense that whenever <coughs> I may not be able to see the fruit that's being born out of the efforts of the, that we put out there, 
There's other people whose eyes are on the same thing. Anybody ever, any, have any of you ever had the situation where God was like screaming at you or patting you on the back and you couldn't see it until somebody else pointed it out? That's part of the reward that comes from being in a community, in a fellowship of believers, is that we are there to remind one another and show and say, hey, look, oh, this is good. This is God at work. This is the kingdom coming into existence here and now. And we have had the privilege of being part of that. And so all of that fellowship then opens our hearts all the more to feel the warmth of God smiling around us. Being together with other people of a like-minded faith is life-giving and is firm. Now I want to take a moment that there's, there's two, uh, one's kind of an illustration, the other's, if you're in a Monday night study, you've already heard this, but that doesn't give you permission to fall asleep. Um, but I, I think it help us, one helps us understand a little bit about why this can be a challenge, a sense of fellowship for us today. The other, what we're going to drive home, I think, about as deeply as possible why that sense of fellowship is so way in this first illustration, uh, I, I picked up from a guy named Dave Lowry, who's written some books that I find very insightful. And it's a way to reframe our image of what life is about. And he uses the images of a pyramid versus a chain. And I think in this culture that we live in, we're very much encouraged to have a pyramid mentality. And what his sense of this is that a pyramid mentality is that I am striving to get to the pinnacle of that pyramid. That everything that is happening, everything in my life, I am trying to go up, 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 up until I am at the absolute peak of whatever it is that I'm pursuing. <coughs> the issue with that, now, if you're at the top of the pyramid, what do you think the view looks like? Think it's nice? You see everything, right? And anybody that's on the ground, who are they looking up at? So everybody's looking up at me, and I can see everything. It's a gorgeous view. Here's the problem with the pyramid mentality. It hamstrings fellowship. Because if I'm at the top of the pyramid, I can see the stone that's right beneath my feet. But can I see most of what got me there? No. I just see that top stone. And so much of what has been the foundation to rise me to that point is not in my, in my mind. It's not in my line of vision. The other thing is this. Is the top of a pyramid a good foundation to start building something new? What do you think would happen if you tried to build a big house on the top of a pyramid? Work, tip over, okay? And that is the issue when we talk about fellowship. If we have this mentality of I'm going to get to the top so I can look out and see everybody and everybody's looking up at me, is that it's all about me. And once I get to the top, once I'm the best and all I'm focused on is that, there's really not much room to go from there. And so once I'm gone, that pyramid may hang around for a while but nobody else is up there top of it, eventually it's going to decay and it's going to collapse. But a chain, on the other hand, is completely different. Because a chain is all about fellowship. A chain is about linking with the other people around us to form a strong bond. A chain adds link after link after link and extends eternally. A chain is about making sure that each link is strong because we want that chain to withstand the test of time. A chain is in fellowship not just with the ones that are forming the link now. A chain is in fellowship with the links that went before and also with the links that are coming after. Because I am building this, this link. We are building this link on the rich heritage and foundation that was laid for us by the people that came before. And we are now striving to build the strongest link that we can. 
And it's not going to look the same as the one before because we are building this link in our time, in our place, and relevant to who we are and what the world needs today. And then we are in fellowship with the ones that are coming later because we realize that we are building the foundation on which they are going to form their being. It is all about connection. It's about mutual strength. It's about mutual love. It's about mutual support. It's about making sure that what we are doing is firm and secure so that the faith that we hold is well-lived and a consistent strong fashion. And that way, the ones that are coming later look at us and say, that is a life of faith. That is what it looks like to follow Christ. That is the model I want to adhere to. And then they continue that chain into the future. That's one of my, my encouragement is for us to, to reframe our thinking. If we have a pyramid mentality, fellowship of believers is so important is because the voices of the world that scream in our head often send us down rabbit trails. Have you ever been around somebody, or maybe it was you yourself, that was in that situation, you were feeling really down, and then you got this idea of, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go hit the gym, and I'm going to get in great shape, and when I have that awesome physique, then I'm going to feel better about myself. If I can get to that next promotion, if I can get to that next achievement, if I can land that next account, if I can, you know, make this next breakthrough of work, if I jump into work in the midst of this crisis, that is going to help me get through. If I throw myself full board into whatever my hobby or my sport or my activity is, and I can really see the fruit of that bear out, and I get to the top of my game, that's going to make me feel better. And I'll feel complete, and I'll feel whole. Those are the kind of things that the world pushes to us to make us feel accepted, to make us feel loved, to make us feel worthy. But every one of them, eventually, will come up and Every one of them. Because eventually something's going to happen that derails us. And it doesn't matter how good we look, it's still going to hurt. And it doesn't matter how accomplished we are, it's still going to cut us off. Please. And so when we put our stock in those things, when we listen to the, the world that says that is where you find your worth, and that's the, the truth of what God has for us. And this is what Nalan says. I had not thought about this before, but I think he's really on to something. The Spirit of God that lives inside each of us, has God ever not loved you? No. God has loved us since the beginning. There is never a moment in our life when God says anything but I want you, I cherish you, 
I value you. You are my child, and I love you. There is never a moment where God does not look at the gifts and the talents and the graces that have been placed within us and said, you are a creature of ultimate worth. You are a gift to this world. And I will help you unlock that gift to bring it into the world. That is the Spirit of God that dwells within each of us. And the thing that's crazy about it, what, do we, what can we do to earn that love and that worth? Absolutely nothing. We can't earn it because it's already there. It existed before we did. And when we start to go look for all of these other things to earn that sense of worth, what we're doing is shutting off our ears and our spirit to the voice inside of us that's already claiming us as God's own. The voice inside of us that is already saying, I love you. I want you. And I always will. The fellowship of believers is so important. <coughs> because when the world beckons us away from that voice, the fellowship of believers reminds us of it. The fellowship of believers reminds us of that God, of that spirit that resides in every one of us and, and helps us to claim that. And so when we move forward from that crisis, we are not claiming something that is false, something that is illusion. We are claiming something that is eternally, abundantly, amazingly real and unshakable. And if we can hang on to that, then we move forward truly renewed and truly strengthened. And then what's also amazing is this. When we feel that sense of crisis, not only do we walk away solid with the assurance of the love of God, but because there are people around us that love us enough to remind us of that, we also know that we are loved and valued and shared <coughs>
take, eat, drink, and as often as you do this, remember me. This morning, that's what I'm going to invite us to do in these next moments as we as we listen to the choir. Let the love of God sing in. Remember who you are. The beloved child of God. You have a call, you have a grace, and you have a gift. And let God speak that to you this morning. Would you pray? Gracious God, as we come before you, well, we know that life isn't easy. We know that there are many things that will distract us from the end of the world, that will pull our ear away from the still small voice that reminds us of who we are and of your eternal love for us. And so, Lord, as we take a few moments to reflect on what it means to serve you, on what it means to be redeemed, on what it means to have a Savior that spared nothing to show us the path to salvation, to show us what it means to truly live a life of faith and grace. And we ask that you would strengthen us and warm us. And we ask that you would let each of us come into a deeper understanding and appreciation of who we are as your children.